I am racist. Have you ever considered that, although you and your beliefs might be vehemently opposed to racism of any kind, you might in fact be racist? On Sunday, as I read through the first accounts of George Floyd's murder, unaware of the outcry that was brewing and with just the BBC news in front of me, I read of a black man who had been reported by a shop assistant on suspicion that he'd used a fake $20 bill. I read that the employee said that Floyd was drunk and appeared not to be in control of himself. I imagine that I were one of the three police officers moving towards a car with three black men inside, drunk, and I immediately found myself trying to justify any subsequent actions that I might take. As I read, the officer pulls a gun on Floyd, ordering him to show his hands. This lethal power feels disproportionate uncomfortable, but I nonetheless begin to attempt to justify it against the images of black criminals that pervade my consciousness, because I've seen enough of them in Hollywood movies, the news, TV shows. And then I read of a pleading, desperate, suffering human being who endured unthinkable pain for 8 minutes and 46 seconds until he died. And I filled with sadness, with the sinking feeling that I feel right now, that my white lens, as though transforming the events as I read them, had meant that I treated Mr. Floyd with quite so much scepticism. We have to accept that we're products of our environments, absorbing every experience and encounter as though we wore glasses whose lenses were shaped by everything we ever see or hear. And these environments that shape us are slow to change. Our grandparents grew up with minstrel shows. Well, why don't you get a job and go to work? No, who let me a job this morning? Where? I went down to the post office and that man couldn't let me have one of them jobs as a letter told him. Our parents with gollywogs. And we with TV shows like this. And look what you've done to my foot. It's a craziness is what it is. So now we consigned to wheelchair. So we got no option but to take the rest of the week off. The Lord sure do work in mysterious ways. They got the whole world. Unless we forget the country whose victory in the great wars has been so deeply etched into our story of our great nation has since, within some of our parents' lifetimes, held the grandfather of Barack Obama in concentration camps in Kenya, where prisoners were burnt alive, their ears sliced off and their testicles castrated. And I say lest we forget with more than a hint of irony, because most people won't be able to recall this from their memories of history classes at school, because they weren't ever taught it. So what have I been doing and what can you do to fight your racism? Well, institutional racism is rife and has played out in these horrendous abuses of white power. But fundamentally, institutions are people. The judges, often old white men who make the laws of the land. The politicians who implement the policy, the leaders, business people, employees, policemen and women. All people. And as people, we help to give life to the beast. As long as we fail to force ourselves, actively force ourselves to confront our racism. So first, accept you are racist. Not a racist, a person with racist beliefs, but racist nonetheless. A person whose lens is biased against black people, whether you like it or not. Second, I'm taking the time to be introspective. In the same way, I like to think and process and write down my own ideas when starting to formulate ideas for an essay as I begin researching and learning from others. Here too, I've been thinking very actively and for prolonged periods. First of all, I've been thinking about the advantages I've had in my own life over all kinds of people. My education, my parents, my relatively stable financial position. These are all things that I can smile about, but I can also recognize that they are by no means universal. And I am repeatedly, I mean daily at the moment, reminding myself of these things. 
my gender, my sexual orientation, being born in 1995, my skin color, all things I had no control over, but which I must stay conscious of. Second, while I understand that I won't ever understand, I'm at least trying as much as I can to empathize with the black community. Now, there's a Buddhist form of meditation and I invite you to join in with me in this now. Think and feel in your core the love that you feel for your family. Imagine your parents closing your eyes, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your friend. Your teacher now, feel that same love and warmth and empathy for them as a human. And now think about a black person you know. Feel love and warmth towards them. And imagine the feeling they feel when, as a member of your university, they are told they can't come in because visitors aren't allowed. Or when a policeman asks to search them because they're black. But we'll never fully understand. Empathy is the most powerful tool we have to force ourselves into a place of discomfort, to feel the human impact of racism. When our base human instincts of self-centered self-preservation distance us from anything we don't personally encounter. And finally, I thought long and hard about my role in all of this about, for instance, whether I felt it was right for me to post on social media, sharing resources I've neither read nor watched, whether I should post a black square, arguments for and against this, whether I, as a white man, can add to the conversation without dominating it, and thus perpetuating the very implicit systems of racism that I'm trying to help overcome, whether projecting black voices as it seems acceptable to do at the moment is in fact instilling a relationship of dominance and reliance. And this isn't to say at all that I necessarily disagree with anything anyone else has said, but I invite you just to think deeply about these issues and your role as we move forward. And once I've given these ideas some thought, or I have questions or just a desire to discuss, I talk. I've been talking to white people I know and to the few black friends I have. And more importantly, I'm getting a whole, whole lot better at actually listening. Not only hearing the parts that confirm my own point of view and dismissing the rest, but allowing my point of view to be challenged. Listening with a skeptical astuteness that engages with what's being said, but equally an open-mindedness that is far less dominant, far less dismissive. Every single person sees things, interprets things in different ways. And the approach to discussion and debate is pretty simple, as summarized by this tweet. Normalize changing your opinion on something after learning new information. It's okay, I promise. Now I've been talking for hours of an evening with my girlfriend Beth about what her colleagues of color have been feeling and the ideas they've been sharing with her. We've been talking about resources we've come across and we've also reflected on the comparisons, for example, between privilege as a white person and privilege as a man. Talk, listen, challenge and question in a way that is genuinely inquisitive, uncertain, rather than seeking to undermine or just reinforce a point of view you already hold. In life generally, this is something I'm not great at, I know that and I'm working to be better. And I'm trying to make sure that this openness to other ideas goes beyond actively seeking conversations with people I know to seeking to learn much more from those who just know more than me about this topic. That means listening to the experiences of black people online and again, watching videos from Ehis and V to greater empathize and understand how they feel. It means replacing a few of the productivity podcasts I like to listen to on my runs with podcasts like Seeing White and Code Switch. This is only the beginning, but I will certainly be looking to work my way through all of these over the coming months. Over breakfast, I've started reading a few of the smaller articles from a list I came across, and I'll link to that in the description. And I watched the documentary 13th this week, which I really cannot recommend highly enough. I'm critically engaging, thinking and considering. And in doing so, I'm trying to persistently link the things I'm learning about the past to the present. Building my web of understanding as to why, for example, a third of black men in America can expect to go to prison during their lives, yet the figure is just one in every 17 people for white men. Why more black people live in poorer communities, why black people are more likely to commit crimes, and even more likely to be convicted of them. When learning about the past, I'm connecting it to 
not dislocating it from the present. I'm questioning my advocacy of the ideal of a meritocracy by learning why people of merit, and I include myself on that list, have obtained their merit. Greater opportunities, which I certainly didn't choose, but to which I must choose to strive to widen access. I didn't learn about slavery at all during the eight years I spent studying history at school. And the little I did learn from TV shows and anecdotal conversations left me with, on the one hand, a feeling that I am amazingly lucky to live at a time where the horrors of forced labor are at least to a significant degree behind us in the UK. But on the other hand, I had this feeling of disgust at those who just sat by and did nothing to oppose the lashings, the rape, and the murder. And I felt like, how could anyone ever have done that? But when slavery was legal, the people who benefited were almost never the ones doing the beating. Many weren't even involved in the brutality. That was most often happening in far-flung lands, well away from them. Not visible and not felt. No screams, no pain. People say all the time, well, I don't understand how people could have tolerated slavery. How could they have uh, made peace with that? How could people have gone to a lynching and participated in that? How did people uh, make sense of this segregation, this uh, white and colored only drinking? That's so crazy. I just, if I was living at that time, I would have never tolerated anything like that. And the truth is we are living at this time and we are tolerating it. Finally, I'm committing to confronting my own racism and that of others. In just this last week, spending time to actively reflect on my privilege to engage in feeling empathy for people of color, attempting to at least consider how it must have felt to be the one black guy in my year of 150, to talk, to learn, to sign petitions, and read stories. I felt I've become much more aware of just how little I even considered that race was an issue, even considered that my own views might actually, in fact, be racist. But I hope that by actively engaging in the ways I've set out, over the course of months and years, not days, I will gain ever more consciousness of my own biases. In the same way I called people gay at school and am now hyper-conscious of just how wrong that was, so too time and openness and the techniques I've shared can bring me, bring us, I really hope, towards a place where we cannot help but see much more clearly our biases and that our way of seeing and living may in fact be racist. And in seeing it thus, let us strive to make it ever less so. Now, I'll be donating all of the ad revenue from this video to charities supporting the Black Lives Matter movement, so go back and watch them again, and actively pursue discomfort in your thoughts and your conversations, and let's strive to empathize more than we disdain. We can and we will be better.